Coming up on Your Mind First, we'll be joined by the first partner of California, Jennifer Siebel Newsom. We're talking mental health, educator burnout, work-life balance, and oh, so much more, plus an opportunity for you to ask all of your questions to the first partner. A brand new episode of Your Mind First starts right now. Welcome into episode two of Your Mind First here on AXA YouTube and AXA Facebook. My name is Michael Kelly. Thanks so very much for being with us. If you missed our fir first episode, we would invite you uh, to, to watch it. What an incredible conversation with some of our educational leaders about the need to be open and honest and raw when it comes to talking about mental health and, and what all of us are going through to some extent. Um, and, and that's what we're going to try to do over the course of this series. And that brings us to our guest today, the first partner of California, Jennifer Siebel Newsom, joins us here on Your Mind First. First partner, thanks so much for doing this. We're thrilled for the opportunity to talk with you today. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, let's jump right in. We have talked a lot about the stigma around mental health. And, and mm -hmm. while there has been a lot of progress made over the course of the last decade, there's still work to be done. So how do we work to further stigmatize, destigmatize mental health? Hmm. Great question. And, and first of all, I just want to thank you for having me on and thank you all for all of the work you do day in and day out on behalf of our children, our nation's future, um, and also for everything you've dealt with over the past few years in particular from COVID to having to deal with it personally and professionally, and then probably also getting a little riffraff from parents. Um, we're living in strangely divisive times, and that also connects to mental health and our nervous systems and too many people living in fight or flight and um, us really kind of needing to ground ourselves as individuals and as a community and society to really kind of slow down and reconnect our heads and our hearts and recognize our common humanity. Um, so in terms of like your, your broader question, you know, I think I think a lot of it has to do with modeling self-care and acknowledging mental health in your leadership positions while also working with children and their parents to have them practice mindfulness and breath work um, and just acknowledge all of the strains and pressures on families um, in modern America. And that part of dealing with that all, right, is addressing uh, their nervous systems and again, their mental health and just helping them acquire the tools um, again, from breath work to mindfulness to daily meditation practices um, that will ultimately help them uh, throughout the course of their lives. I, I want to follow up on that because so many of our educational leaders are hesitant to talk about mental health because they're afraid of the optics. They're afraid of appearing weak to their board. They're afraid mm -hmm. of appearing weak to the parents or the students who they come in contact with. So specifically around leadership, First Partner, mm -hmm. how do we work to have those conversations? So look, there's strength and vulnerability. Empathy is having an empathetic person is, is demonstrative of strength. We, obviously, we live in this rugged individualistic society, this, you know, power over other society where, you know, we've socialized generations to disconnect their heads from their hearts and repress their emotions and feelings and whole parts of themselves. So we have to kind of reconstruct that, um, that I idealism and that ideology, which uh, some would argue stems in more conservative circles and is reinforced um, by the media. And that's something I do through my documentary films. And I did that through my documentary film, The Mask You Live In. And I continue to address that work in all of my my films. But really, there's strength in care. There's strength in empathy. There's strength in vulnerability. And I can't say that enough. And I think that just you all have to say it and say it with conviction and practice it. And, um, you know, again, recognize that if people see that as weak, that's their own fear and their own disconnection from their own humanity. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, if you don't have a connection to your heart, if you don't have relations with other others, if you're not able to take care of yourself, what do you have? If you're not able to care for yourself, how can you care for others? So it's, it's critical to being a caregiver and we're all caregivers. And you guys, by virtue of what you do, working with our most vulnerable population, our children, you're caregivers. And, and we really have to uplift care in our society and normalize that 
part of being human is caring for yourself. And all you have to do is look at online and look at the political discourse and what's going on in not just our country, but the world in terms of divisiveness and, and hate and bigotry and racism and misogyny, and even rolling back women's rights and rolling back LGBTQ rights. And to, to understand that um, people are living in, in intensely um, fear, a fear-based society. And again, not everyone, but enough people are. Um, and But again, it's you know putting it back on them as they have to deal with their own trauma you're happy to help them. But again, you know, reinforcing how critical care is to us moving forward together as a society, to us building bridges together as a society. I like what you said about the strength and empathy, because it, it makes me think about so much of the work that we do is, is checking in on others, right? And making sure they're okay. There's a great television show that, that I don't know if you've watched, but Ted Lasso, uh, mm -hmm. in which they talk him. about be curious, <laughs> not judgmental, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the need to show empathy and to check in with other people to make sure that they are doing okay. On that note, First Partner, you have had a lot on your plate the last couple of years. Yeah. I, I wonder just how all of this has impacted you personally and the people mm -hmm. that you've come in contact with. No, I appreciate that so much. I mean, look, I'm a working mother with multiple young children and I'm obviously married to the governor who has uh, felt the pressure of taking care of 40 million people in more ways than, than one over the past few years. And so I've had to be strong and hold him together. But in doing so, again, it's like put your own off oxygen mask on first. I've really had to learn to take care of myself. And I've, I've sought help in that regard. I've had to have people hold me accountable for doing my own mindfulness and meditation practice, um, my own you know, practice of yoga um, and, and slowing down. You know, one of the things I do that I recommend, and it's one of the reasons it's a big part of our initiatives out of the First Partners Office, is I recommend people spend time in nature. And what better nature is there available to us than California state parks? And it's one of the reasons we've made them accessible and free to so many families in California. Um, but time in nature is critical. I write in a gratitude journal as often as I can. I find that I'm like the nicest person <laughs> after I've read, written in my gratitude journal. And I highly recommend that to other people too. Um, you know, we, um, as a family, again, you know, exercise is important, uh, but we also, we have a lot of animals. I, I find whenever I'm super stressed, I, if I have the, the opportunity, I'm like, I spend time with with our animals, I, you know, obviously hugging the kids. I mean, you're so lucky to work with all these beautiful young children because I think there's nothing more sort of magical and beautiful and pure than being with children and being with animals. So we have a mini farm at home and that's one of the things that sort of like is decompressing to me. I work in the garden as well, even though I'm not a great gardener, but I'm learning. <laughs> so um, just again, taking advantage of all that California has to offer. And then obviously, um, you know, asking for help. It takes a village. None of us really can achieve what we achieve, have achieved on our own. You think about all the people that lifted you up to get you to where you are today or held your hand or guided you or gave you that pearl of wisdom or that advice. Um, so again, acknowledging the people before you, the people on sh whose shoulders you you stand um, also, I think, has helped. Um, and then asking for help. I'm, I'm just, I have to, like, I cannot work. I have like three or four jobs. One of them is for pay. The rest are volunteer. And then I have four young children. And so I have to ask for help because I can't always ask my husband for help, um, given what's on his plate. Uh, and so that's just, you know, part of like not being afraid to ask for help. Just a reminder, if you have questions for the first partner of California, Jennifer Siebel Newsom, uh, you can post them in the chat and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. You talked about how it's impacted you. I, I wonder just, you, you've come in contact with so many people and I'm sure you've, you've heard your for, fair share of stories over the last couple of years. Can you describe the, the toll that the pandemic has had on them and, and, uh, and in turn, how you've been able to help? Yeah, thank you. Well, obviously right out of the gate with the pandemic, I was the first one on the phone dialing for dollars and laptops and um, you know, Wi-Fi access for children. And that was really important to me in the beginning. Um, but again, I, I, I did as much as I could just talking to parents because I knew if I was struggling um, that I needed to be a source of light and support to other women and and men who followed me on, on social media just to kind of, you know, try and provide some hope and, and support and inspiration. Um, but, you know, look, across the, the state, we've seen the numbers, 45% of teens in 21 this is 
you know, it's obviously the number's worse now, but um, feeling hopeless and sadness. And we know the anxiety and depression numbers were already going up because of the advent of modern technology. And again, all of that's been worsened by the pandemic and more time spent online. And then suicide ideation, right? I think 20% of kids and teens in 2021 had serious suicidal thoughts and contemplation. And again, you've seen suicidal um, ideation go up in the LGBTQ community, but but mostly girls and, and young girls of color. So again, there's a lot to kind of look at as the problem and how do we get out of this. Uh, parents that I've interviewed across the state um, were just sort of at wit's end, especially moms working multiple jobs, having multiple children, not you know able to, to be there for their kids, fathers sort of feeling despondent. Um, obviously the situation for essential workers is even worse. I've interviewed a family in my documentary whose children were alone 10 to 14 hours a day during the pandemic. Um, and what, you know, and then the daughter of course spent too much time online and then that, that snowball effect of learning loss, but also um, mental health uh, problems. So again, like for me, what I'm most proud of is the governor's investment, $4.7 billion in the youth and behavioral health initiative. You know, we're building the plane as we fly it, as we recreate this system to make sure that we are meeting kids where they're at and we're testing them regularly, screening them regularly to make sure that they have the best in class mental health um, and well-being support so that they can realize their potential and, and not be stymied or, or held back by, you know, what I would argue is just really challenging times, trying times, again, exacerbated by technology addiction, video game violence, um, and again, addiction and, and the harm and the, the horrifying reality that we find ourselves in on social media. Um, again, I, I just, I feel for younger generations that have grown up with this. I didn't grow up with this. I, I literally spent time in nature, in a creek, in a forest as a kid growing up. And I'm so grateful. And I truthfully, it's one of the reasons I'm so determined to make sure that kids spend more time outdoors in California's natural beauty. And then if they can't, that we have, you know, we, we do more with libraries. It's again, two of my big initiatives are investing in libraries and again, in parks, just to make sure that children aren't spending all their time on these devices, which we know are exacerbating the mental health problems that we already had in this country. Well, and, and on that note, August is is National uh, National Wellness Month. You, you yes, talked right. a little bit about it earlier uh, in terms of some of the things that you do to to de stress and to kind of get away from the technology and everything that that can be so so stressful and anxiety filled. Yes. I, I get. Are there other things that you would recommend for for our educational leaders who are looking for ways to kind of find that work life balance? I mean, I, again, I, th I think you know, even a ten minute walk in nature is so good for your health sleep is everything a regular i am the my husband's taught me to go to bed <laughs> on time and he gets very cross with me when i'm like flexing around and you know at night doing this and checking on this and that and that and tucking kids on but he's really been good about reminding me of how important my sleep is and i think i got so used to not sleeping when i had kids that i again i'm not as good about my bedtime but again this having the same time that you go to bed every night right and then having that routine of physical exercise and activity every day and mindfulness um i have a neuroscientist friend who's actually on our advisory physical fitness and and mental health uh, or mental well-being council who is adamant and he's like, Jen, you're only hurting yourself if you don't you know, meditate for 10 minutes a day. That's all you have to do. You don't have to do 20 minutes twice a day, just 10 minutes a day. The wonders are, the, the, the impact is, is on your, your nervous system and your mental health and well-being. Even on longevity, is, it's all there. Like the science is all pointing in the direction that any daily practice of meditation, yoga as well, is just so good for your mental health. So I try and do that once a week with my kids. Um, and I recommend you bring that into the school. It's one of, it's going to be one of the recommendations I'm going to kind of keep beating the drum of over the next few years um, is, you know, there's a lot you can do in a school environment. It's really just taking initiative. And if you weren't able to do it at home, bring it to school and do it with the kids and the teachers. It's interesting you bring that up uh, in terms of the sleep aspect, uh, four and a half year old and a 14 month old. So sleep oh. is not a concept that I know very well these you days. You are not but sleeping, I'm sorry. <laughs> that is okay. We power through, right? That, that's yeah. how you do it. Um, but it doesn't, but let me be honest with you. And this is, we don't talk about all this. It, it, it doesn't work. Like I was a zombie for, you know, 
for so much of, of those years. And it wore on me physically, emotionally, and mentally, and, and you know, trying to be superwoman and do it all and, and be, you know, have it all. And it really comes down to partnership. It's one of the reasons I took on the title of first partner, not first lady, because my husband and I have to partner. Otherwise, he can't do his job at the state level, but he also then can't be here for the kids. So it's really about partnership and supporting each other. And it's one of the reasons I just made a documentary that maybe it can be beneficial to all of you. It's out. You can see it um, on demand anywhere, basically, that you buy or rent uh, movies, but it's called Fair Play. And it's about all the invisible work that women have shouldered. And it shines a light on the benefits to men when they step into care at home. And so again, this is just part of my long-term um, objective of helping us realize the power and potency of care and the care economy and leaning into care in America. Because the more men do it, the more women are liberated to pursue their passions, but also the healthier children are. When dads do 40% of the child care and domestic work at home, children have better cognitive, uh, they have better, fewer behavioral problems, greater cognitive development or cognitive skills, and healthier long-term relationships just as men themselves are less likely to be depressed and on prescription meds, they have greater longevity, they're happier, they have better sex lives. And then the benefits to women when, again, partners do 40% of the um, childcare and domestic work at home, the benefit to, to if it's a woman partner, again, is uh, more free time, less anxiety, less stress. So again, all of this points in the direction to me of self-care and partnership as really the model that we all have to embrace and take on to you know, move through this quite trying and challenging 21st century. I want to shift back to the students for a second, because we saw uh, the U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy do something that we really haven't seen before, and that's issue an advisory on protecting youth mental health. And then mm -hmm. you co-wrote the article in May addressing the youth mental health crisis. We had an opportunity to speak with Dr. Nadine Burke Harris a couple months ago about ACEs and, and the yeah. impact that the pandemic and so many other things can have, not just in the short term, but also in the long term. So my question to you is, is what concern do you have about the role the pandemic has played in creating what we hope is not the case, but potentially long term effects uh, and, and impacting our, our six million plus California public school students? I think the, the impact is tremendous, but it, but let me not separate something. If you're a parent that is not well and you're not taking care of yourself at home, how can you expect your children to heal? And that's why I like a lot of my work is focused on parents and families and mothers because we set the tone. I, I, have, a, I have a couple of kids with dyslexia and two kids that had tremendous anxiety during the pandemic. One thrived. One was totally lost and addicted to like the eventual iPad that I got and then removed and two had tremendous anxiety. And what I found was that when I came home or I was at home working from home, when I came down from working on interviewing people for my documentary or whatever I was doing as first partner, and I had like the weight of the world on my shoulders and stress, like my kids carried it. And so until I learned to take care of myself, like I can't expect them to change. So again, I, that's why it's so important that any adult and children's lives from the administrators to the teachers practice self-care because then, and the parents especially, because then our children can model that, right? And they, we can deal with, you know, the beauty is children are malleable. Like I, I actually would argue my, one of my kids still is like, he challenges me uh, with his, whatever's going on. He had serious OCD at one point where I thought, I mean, I literally thought I was going to have to institutionalize him. I was scared to death. My husband was freaked out because he stopped eating. He literally wouldn't eat. He was so scared of germs and all the confluence of a lot of things that were happening, protesters outside of our house, so much hate and violence and death threats being directed at us. And he just absorbed it all and picked up and he was freaked out. So what, what I share that because, you know, at the end of the day, um, our children, I think to a certain extent are malleable enough that if we can get them early, I mean, I think about this, let me make a comparison to my kids with dyslexia, the one that we caught earlier, who we gave wrapped around, gave him as much support as we could. He's thriving compared to his older sister who we caught later. Cause she was so good at hiding that she couldn't read. She just had this incredible wicked memory like my husband has. And so she struggled more because more time passed. So my thing, and this is why I love Mark Galley and HHS and all the folks involved in um, the, child, the behavioral health initiative is yeah. if we can meet kids where, where they're at and meet them earlier and just start a daily practice at schools 
of mindfulness, meditation, yoga, whatever it is. I've seen this public school that I'm obsessed and want to visit in Corona Madera that I used to drive by them to take my kids to the Montessori preschool in the morning when we lived in Marin County. And every day at eight o'clock, the entire administration, faculty, students were out on the blacktop doing calisthenics, yoga, mindfulness, running, exercising, and having their sort of like grounding daily convening. I promise you this school had like incredible academic results. I was really impressed with it. And I keep telling myself, we have to get back out there and see what they're doing now. But just instituting that and then sharing best practices with parents so they can practice them at home. I, we have to do this, right? And then we can address the deeper trauma that you know many children who've lost family members or been in neglectful or abusive relationships have experienced. But the core of us, I think, can recover at, at the youngest of ages, if we meet them where they're at, we reduce their time online. I do not think more time online is better for children. Less time online, more time in nature, and more time sort of calming their nervous systems. If we can do that, then I have tremendous hope. But again, you got to get the parents, you got to get the teachers involved as well. One of the educational leaders we had on our first episode of Your Mind First created something called Mindful Moments. He was a principal at an elementary school in Pacific Grove, uh, Buck Rogman over at Forest Grove Elementary. He's since moved to the, the district level. Um, but it was one of the greatest things that we saw over the course of the pandemic was the impact that those two to three minute videos that he did every single day for his yeah. students had on their mental well-being. And so right. it's, it's just, this is the type of stuff that we need to do more often and the stuff that maybe we don't talk about enough. Yes, we don't, right on. And so, I mean, look, I wanna partner with you guys in any way to continue to just share best practices and uplift them. And it's one of the reasons we produce the California Healthy Kids Thriving Minds Project, as well as one of the reasons uh, we launched the Physical Fitness and Mental Health Council. Is it's all about partnership and uplifting, setting goals and then uplifting best practices. And again, meeting kids where they're at. Uh, on that note, uh, California partnered with the Child Mind Institute uh, to create, uh, as, as you've alluded to, the California Healthy Minds Thriving Kids. Can you explain a, a little bit for the people who don't know, what is it? And, and then what hope do you have that it can have um, in terms of impacting our students and our youth? Great. So the um, Thriving Kids Healthy Minds Project are largely um, educational and preventative videos and curricula to be used by students themselves, teachers, and um, parents um, that address understanding thoughts and feelings, managing big emotions, um, relaxation techniques, and mindfulness. And they're in English and Spanish, K through six, middle school, or K through five, middle school and high school. Again, in English and Spanish, they're videos and curriculum that you can do with exercises that you can do in the classroom or do at home. And so I highly recommend them. And again, this was just our attempt to, again, as we're building the plane, we're flying it, right? This is a big system, a $4.7 billion five-year investment that is gonna take time as we also grow the pipeline of folks in the mental health arena that are gonna support you all um, in the schools and are again gonna you know, help with screening and, and prevention at the earliest of ages. Let's dive in a little bit to just the work the state has done to invest in school counselors because sure. we can talk about this all day. There is clearly a need for more mental health professionals. When That's you right. see and, and, and not to call people out, but when you see an insurance provider like Kaiser Permanente not able to provide mental health services to people, when you're told the wait list is three to six months to see somebody, mm -hmm. clearly work needs to be done. And, and at the school site level, the state has done a remarkable job in investing in school counselors moving forward. I wonder just what more you would like to see done to help address this crisis. Look, I think the roadmap is there. And again, I have tremendous confidence in HHS and their team and the new um, the new Surgeon General um, role that um, is coming in. And so I have tremendous confidence also because it's a big focus of ours and of the governor's and my own that we're going to design a system to obviously grow the professionals involved. Part of that is value and care and the care economy and incentivizing and, and redesigning um, opportunities uh, that will enable more folks to to see this as like as a, a 
an incredible professional opportunity and a, 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 a well-paid um, opportunity. So, I, so again, I, I think what I'm trying to do in my in the world that I can sort of control out of the first partner's office while this plane is being built is again to make sure that schools and districts are taking advantage of the resources that the government is providing to them um, while this again the systems are being created and the pipeline is being built simultaneously we've done so much in the realm of farm to school where we're trying to focus on um, sort of supporting the whole child and making sure children get fresh nutritious wholesome food locally grown um, so we're building out that whole, if you're not privy to it, I'm really, really proud of the farm to school work we're doing because it's really about procurement now from local um, small and mid-scale BIPOC farmers to again, that are all doing climate smart ag to again, ensure that children are getting fresh local produce. Simultaneously, you know, we've invested so much in uh, the parks passes for fourth graders and their families and for um, CalWORKs recipients and um, th there's, you know, the, we also have the library pass that we want families to take advantage of. So families are spending more time in nature with their children. Um, and then again, my role as co-chair with Ronnie Lott on the Physical Fitness and Mental Health Council is again to support you all um, by making sure that the state uh, designs uh, goals for ca all Californians um, and then promotes best practices and then creates a more positive and inclusive physical fitness and mental health um, sort of community uh, in California. So again, we're all kind of marching in that direction. Change takes time, right? I mean, the bummer of, of all this is everything that we've invested in and are committed to, you may not see the benefits or the fruits of our label for a couple, couple of years. And, and, and then, you know, the next governor is gonna get to, I think, reap the, the benefits of all these really smart investments. But again, like we're all about partnership and uplifting best practices. So. I just want to put out to all of you that we want to meet you where you're at. We want to make sure you feel supported and that you also um, are able to take advantage of these resources, resources which are tremendous. Uh, we want to thank everybody who's tuning in. Uh, First partner, great to see you again. According to Cindy, uh, love your fifth grade teacher, Cindy Jackinette. Thank you for joining. Oh, Cindy, the <laughs> that's so great. But just want to I let you know, uh, you've, you've got people watching from all over the state here. Uh, if you happy. have any questions for the first partner before she has to go, again, make sure that you put them into the chat. And we, I think you talked about it earlier, this, this physical fitness and mental well-being council. Most states, it's just a physical fitness council. California right. took the, the next step to make mental well-being a priority. Have, have we seen... Um, everything that you want in terms of adding that that mental well-being aspect to it, if you will. Yeah, so great. So thank you for that. Yeah, so historically, governors only had a physical fitness council, but physical fitness and mental well-being are intrinsically linked. We know that. And we know how important all of our health and well-being is to us being able to thrive and be our best selves in the world. And obviously, the pandemic exacerbated that. And um, just modern living, it's, you know, the cost of living, droughts, uh, climate change, wildfires, like all of that has has really stressed out our nervous systems. And so that's why, again, the physical fitness and mental health partnership is is so important to us. We are we have an incredible advisory council um, that is helping us hone in on our goals and objectives. Uh, we are looking for an executive director uh, to basically run the council. Uh, but I'm really proud of it. It's obviously one of my priority initiatives and there's a lot coming, uh, a lot that is also going to be about sort of a partnership, right, with the schools because we've invested so much in that community school model, but also in the before, after school and then summer school model. Um, so again, more partnership with you is ideal. I know that we in the state, everything's sort of been localized at the school district level, but just know that our values are with you all. We know you do God's work and socializing and, and developing and um, educating our future. Uh, and so again, anything that we can do to make your lives easier and to really demonstrate success of what's possible when we're all committed to the whole child, meeting them where they're at and addressing um, you know, the downside of the past few years in particular, but also again, looking at this media addictions 
you know, the has been going on since the advent of iPhones um, in the early 2000s. So like we have to grapple this and deal with it as a society. And so again, I'm, I'm committed to that work as well. I, I know you are short on time. So I want to close with this first partner. And, and it's a little bit of a loaded question, but I also think it's a, it's a good one to ask. What gives you hope about the progress and continued progress that we can continue to make around mental health and mental wellness? Mm, thank you. Well, I, California is sort of a shining light and uh, by virtue of being the fifth largest economy and this quasi nation state uh, with 40 million residents, uh, the, the largest population in our country. Um, and we walk the walk despite all of our diversity and differences and we're really leading. And I think, you know, we, we partner with the, the federal government in that regard and we partner with states that really recognize too that these are trying times and that, you know, again, that this mental health crisis that we're all uh, having to confront um, can be resolved. Uh, and, and so, I, again, I, I think the $4.7 billion investment in, in the behavioral health and, and youth initiative is going to get us to that next place. But we, again, we have to build the plane as we're flying it. And so I just appreciate your patience, but also um, want to uplift the best practices that are working for you all and that maybe you can share with us. And then we obviously want to share and we'll continue to share what we're doing in the realm of farm to school and libraries and parks and social emotional learning. And again, physical fitness and mental health, because we know that there are easy behavioral solutions that just require practice. Um, and the more you all can model that and then model it for your teachers and then share these best practices with parents while you're also engaging the children in some of these practices. I mean, I think that's how we heal and I think that's how we come together and how we build community. And I think that's what we need more than anything in our society today is building community. And so you guys all have these gorgeous hubs of community that the more you can do there, I, I just think we can heal together as communities. And ultimately, I'm a firm believer that as California goes, so can go the nation. And so I just look forward to inspiring um, a recognition of the value of care, of the value of empathy and vulnerability, that there's strength and vulnerability and finding ways to continue to work together on that front. Well, thank you for being vulnerable with us. Thank you, thank for, you. for spending so much time with us uh, here on this Tuesday afternoon. The first partner of California, Jennifer Siebel Newsom, here on Your Mind First. First partner, thanks so much for the time. This was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. I love to you all and so much gratitude. Thanks so much. And just a reminder, if you um, are wanting to hear more from the first partner and the great work that the state's doing, we are partnering with the first partner's office to, um, to make sure that all of the resources are available to you on our website, axa.org. So that will be coming uh, in the next couple of days. Again, if you're just tuning on and if you're just joining us, uh, welcome to Your Mind First. This is, uh, this is the second of five episodes in which we will be discussing all things mental health. And next week, we're thrilled about the discussion that will take place as we'll be joined by these three educational leaders to talk about education burnout. Um, there's a lot to discuss and we will be tackling it from all levels, Amber Lee Alba, the superintendent in Auburn Union School District, Manny Nunez, the assistant superintendent of human resources in Monterey Peninsula Unified School District, and Mohamed Warad, a vice principal over in Elk Grove Unified School District. They will be our guest here on Your Mind First. That comes your way every Tuesday at one o'clock here on AXA Facebook and AXA YouTube. We are so thankful to all of you who have been watching. And just one last reminder, if you are wanting to share your story with us, because we can be open and honest with you, we can share our stories, but we'd also love for you to share yours if you're open to that. And so we're going to put up this QR code, an opportunity to be featured potentially in our upcoming EdCal newsletter. Uh, you can share your tips for work-life balance, your coping strategies. You can visit that bit.ly link, or you can also use the QR code on the right side of your screen. Thanks so much to everybody who has been a part of this episode and the entire series. Again, Your Mind First episodes every Tuesday at one o'clock through the end of the month. For everybody watching, for everybody involved, my name is Michael Kelly. We'll see you next time.